Welcome to Books of Our Time, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today we shall discuss a book called So Damn Much Money, The Triumph of Lobbying and the Corrosion of American Government. The book recounts the decline of Washington politics into little but money and greed and the associated rise of one of Washington's most powerful lobbyists, Gerald Cassidy, who symbolizes the decline of our political life. With me to discuss his book is its author, Robert Kaiser. Mr. Kaiser is a reporter and former managing editor of the Washington Post, who has been following Beltway politics for 45 years. And I am Lawrence R. Valvel, the dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Bob, thank you for coming up from D.C. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so damn much money melds two stories. It melds the story of the rise of a Washington lobbyist, a, a now very wealthy man, who started out as a poor boy named Gerald Cassidy. And it, uh, it, it melds his story with the change in Washington over the course of the last 40 years or so and what Washington has become. Uh, how did you decide to write the story this way, and why do the two stories meld so well? Good questions. I, I started out uh, trying to figure out Washington lobbying. Uh, I found Cassidy and his firm. I thought they would be really good examples. No example can be perfect, but this was pretty good. Uh, but the more reporting I did and the more I studied the history of the firm and how it developed, the more I realized that th that wasn't all I could do, that I, I actually had an opportunity to explain, I thought, uh, this new culture in Washington that you've just alluded to. Uh, and to try to help my countrymen understand what's happened to our politics and why it happened. Uh, so my ambitions rose, the time I devoted to the project increased, uh, but I'm, I'm proud of the result. I think I've, for by my own standards, I've, I've, I've fulfilled my, my plan here. I have, tr I have given you a vivid account of this one guy and his rise, but I've tried to put it in the context of what was happening all around him. Uh, I use him as a guide to what was happening around him. He's a very smart person, quite articulate. He gave me many hours of interviews, uh, which was unusual uh, from a big Washington lobbyist. Uh, and so I was able, I think, I hope, uh, using his commentary and my own reporting and research and the comments of many others whom I interviewed for the book uh, to create this picture of how the rise of the money culture, of which Jerry Cassidy was a manifestation, also uh, colored all of our political life and changed the, the way the political game was played. You know, one thing you said, one rarely hears expressed the way you expressed it, which is to help your countrymen to understand, which is what this book does. It's been a source of great frustration to me for 45 years that so few people seem to understand the way Washington works, something else. Later on, I'll tell a little story about what happened in 1966 that illustrated this. Uh, but your story really is, in a major respect, how Washington works today, or doesn't work today. Thank you. And, and, Ca and Cassidy is, uh, there was a symbiosis there because he not only was a manifestation of it, he was, as described in your book, to no insignificant extent, a cause of it in a way, uh, particularly in the realm of earmarks. Uh, it's fun to talk about this in Massachusetts because one of Cassidy's historical contributions is that he and his original partner, uh, Ken Schlossberg, I say in this book, actually invented the modern earmark. I define uh, the modern earmark as an appropriation by Congress for a purpose that no government agency recommended, that nobody, nobody's thought of as good policy particularly, but to fulfill the ambition of some private or, or local institution that wanted to get some federal money to do something that uh, was part of its own planning and, and ambition. Tufts University was the recipient of the first earmark. Uh, and it was an idea of Jean Mayer, the famous nutritionist who had become the president of Tufts, uh, in the late 70s, mid 70s, and Mayer wanted to build a research center on human nutrition and aging. Uh, this was his field, but he wanted to do it for the Tufts Medical School to make it, to help strengthen Tufts. It was a pretty good idea. Uh, and he was a famous figure in the world of nutrition. It wasn't outrageous that this would happen. 
he had been encouraged by the local congressman. He said, if I can help you while you're President Tufts, let me know. I'll be glad to help you. That was a fellow called Tip O'Neill. And uh, then uh, Meyer calls Schlossberg and Cassidy on the telephone and says, I see you guys have gone into business in Washington as consultants. I wonder if you could help me do this. And they were thrilled. And they, the, Cassidy himself, a lawyer, found some legislation on the books that seemed to authorize government expenditures on behalf of something like a nutrition research center. Uh, with the help of O'Neill's staff and then other members of the Massachusetts delegation at the time, they ended up getting $27 million for Tufts to build this thing, which is down in Boston right now in Chinatown, uh, a thriving institution. It's part of the Department of Agriculture, which is good for Tufts because it means the Department of Agriculture picks up a big part of the tab. Uh, this led to further earmarks for Tufts. Then Boston College heard what was going on, and they hired Cassidy, and they got earmarks for Boston College. Then John Silber showed up at Boston University. He got in on the game. He became Cassidy's biggest single client over the last 35 years, 30 years. Um, and he was getting earmarks to build up BU. Uh, and as you know, of course, the earmarks became one of the most popular games in Washington. John McCain ran his presidential campaign last year against earmarks. Uh, they've become very controversial, but also very popular. And there have been millions and millions of them. So uh, this is a historic truth, as you say, that Mr. Casty and his original partner did contribute to this new culture that we yeah. have. Now, as, as I understand it, an earmark actually is a bill which says this money goes to Tufts University, or this money goes to Boston College or this money goes to the Pirelli Corporation. These are all names that you mentioned in the book. I can remember, uh, Bob, back in the 60s and early 70s, when this kind of thing was thought impossible. It just didn't happen. I remember there was once a tax bill passed at the behest of Raytheon that was called the Raytheon Amendment, and it identified potential recipients in such a convoluted, complicated way that only Raytheon could meet the requirements, right. but nobody ever thought of putting the name Raytheon onto it, you know? Well, in the early days of earmarking, it was similar. Uh, either the name was mentioned only in the report, the legislative report, uh, which was accompanied the legislation, or it was done in that way. This earmark is intended for a multidiscipline university in downtown Boston, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. But yeah, right, right, right. But eventually, yes, you're right. It was. It was no question. It was a. This is for such and such a new laboratory on such and such a campus. Right. Very explicit. Right. What did Silvio Conti have to do with all of this? Well, the Massachusetts delegation of the '70s was a very harmonious group of guys, all guys who got along well with each other and helped each other. And Conti was at that time the ranking Republican on the House Appropriations Committee and a good friend of Tip O'Neill's. They played golf together at the Burning Tree Club in Washington. Uh, their wives were pals. And Silvio uh, Conti uh, helped get these earmarks into appropriations bills and make them possible. There's one, of the, one of Cassidy's big clients was the University of Massachusetts, uh, which has a big Conti building named for Silvio Conti, which was a, the result of an earmark that he helped promote. Uh, so he was a big player. You've mentioned twice now uh, appropriation bills. Now, I think one of the great unknowns to the American public, which I believe you said has a very romanticized view of the way Congress works. Well, or the country works, yes. With that, too, is the difference, uh, the crucial difference between authorization bills and appropriation bills so if you could explain that difference in how the appropriation bills were used, as you said, uh, he, uh, Cassidy first found an authorization bill that seemed to authorize something, and so then they put it into an appropriation bill. But if you would explain that difference. This is, this is like a civics course, but I'm glad to try. The, the basic fact is that the traditional pattern of legislation in Congress to get money out the door of the Treasury for any purpose required two different laws, two pieces of legislation, the authorization bill and the appropriations bill. 
I'll pick a hypothetical example. Say it's a it's a Pentagon program, a weapon. The 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 armed services committees in the House and the Senate would be responsible for authorizing the acquisition of a new airplane, a new cannon, whatever it is. Uh, then the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee in both houses would incorporate this newly authorized weapon into the next budget cycle. There'd be money for it. Uh, and in tandem, if both houses passed both pieces of legislation, the program could then go forward. The airplane could be built and bought. In this era, the last 40 years, increasingly, uh, the appropriations committees took on uh, a number of, the, of enterprises on their own initiative without authorization. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, when Cassidy was launching this business, they were still paying careful attention to having authorization. But by the uh, 80s, early 80s, uh, it was entirely possible to sneak line item appropriations into big omnibus spending bills, as they're called, that were never properly authorized. Uh, and this is a, the legality of this is, is a gray area. It's never been clarified in a definitive court ruling. Um, it, the, the Congress doesn't seem to mind, obviously, because this is the way they bring home the bacon, which is, the, the, you know, that's what earmarks are all about. Uh, so this system has evolved now so that uh, the, appropriation, the appropriators have the power to do the earmarks. Uh, back back uh, in my youth, a uh, hundred years ago, I was a constitutional lawyer. I have never heard that the dichotomy between the appropriations committee and the authorization committees was a constitutionally ordained rule. I always assumed that it's something uh, that is a rule set up by Congress for itself. And if that's true, if Congress chooses not to follow its own rule, well, Congress Correct. chooses not to follow its own and, rule. And of course, you're right. The, the Constitution is very explicit that no money can be spent without the approval of Congress, without a vote of Congress. But there's nothing about procedures. There were no committees in those days. The whole thing is a later invention. Right. Now, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have quoted some people from Congress. Russell Long, uh, the former senator, uh, Chuck Hagel, a more recent senator, Leon Panetta, who's now uh, the head of the CIA, uh, as saying either in very explicit language or in language next door to very explicit, that the Washington is, uh, works on a system uh, of uh, bribery, but it's not called bribery. Now, now how does this happen? You know, this, this section of the book begins with the, with the notorious Jack Abramoff, yes. uh, who uh, the, the Republican lobbyist who got caught and is in jail today. Um, who the scandal surrounding Abramoff brought a lot of this stuff out in a vivid way for the first time. Uh, Abramoff told friends of his, uh, who told me about this, that after he got caught and after he was in trouble and after he'd stopped trying to be a lobbyist, he, he would tell his pals, you know, I participated in a system of legalized bribery. That's what it was. He's referring to the fact that he raised lots and lots of money for the campaigns of the members who were helping him serve his clients uh, and shoveled this money to the politicians who turned around and got him what he was looking for in legislation for his clients. Um, and I heard this and I thought, gee, that's a vivid phrase. That's the kind of thing journalists look for. Uh, and I took it around. I should have shopped this quote around town. Uh, I went to your old college classmate, Fred Wertheimer, and a longtime source of mine, the old president of Common Cause. Uh, he said, oh, he said, look up the Russell Long quote, which I hadn't remembered. Uh, the Russell Long quote is, there's only a hairline's difference between a campaign contribution and a bribe, just a hairline's difference. He said this in the early 70s in a debate in the Senate. Uh, then I had lunch in Washington by chance with Leon Panetta, who was then an academic in California visiting Washington from time to time, and I, who I've known for years and admired, and I said, Leon, here's what Abramoff's telling his pals. He said, I participated in the system of legalized bribery. I said, what do you think of that? He said, well, that's exactly right. That's what it is. And I was, I was taken back, and he gives me this very vivid quote, which you referred to, that's in the book. Uh, Hegel, who I admire a lot, is a very serious, resourceful, creative politician, 
unusual in modern Washington. He reads books, he thinks for himself, he writes his own speeches. Uh, and Hegel said to me, I don't have the quote at the tip of my tongue, but something very similar, that this is, you know, let's not kid ourselves, we know what's going on here. There's another quote in the book that I like a lot uh, from Bob Dole, then senior Republican senator, who explained in the early 80s to the Wall Street Journal uh, a, a really fundamental cardinal fact of life in this modern Washington. He said, there's no poor people's PAC, he said. <laughs> a PAC, of course, is a political action committee. It's a way corporations funnel money to politicians. Um, but uh, uh, Jerry Cassidy said something very similar to me, which is also in the book, where he said, you know, well, nobody's up here supporting the poor. There's nobody making contributions to encourage legislation to help the poor and so on. Uh, you know, money talks. It's, there's no question about it. So how do they keep it? I mean, for example, you might, uh, in the context of answering this question, uh, discuss the Schumer situation and the hedge fund manager situation. And how do they keep it from being actual bribery? What is it that they do that makes it seem like uh, only uh, legalized bribery? You're the lawyer, Larry, not me, but I... <laughs> you don't want my answer. <laughs> Here, here's, here's the deal. This is, is mitigated, or they try to mitigate it, by making it something less than an explicit transaction. Uh, the, the term of art is quid pro quo. That's your guy's term, not mine. It's right. a legal term, but it, what it means is give and get. What's the, what, what's the quid and what's the quo? What are you offering and what are you getting in return? Um, if the quid pro quo is not an explicit transaction, courts have ruled, uh, it's not bribery, it's not illegal. Uh, so the best defense is, well, you know, I guess I raised money from that source and I voted for a bill that helped that source, but I also have money from sources on the other side of that argument. And I also voted for other things that wasn't pleasing, that weren't pleasing to those donors and so on. So you, you cloud the thing this way. The Schumer story is a wonderful example. Uh, and, 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 and another important lesson about how Washington works now. In 2007, the Democrats come back into power in the House and Senate for the first time since 95. And uh, in the excitement of the liberals in, in the Democratic Party back in power, Charles Rangel of New York, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, proposes a change in the tax code which would tax the earnings of hedge fund managers as, well, as earnings. They had had rulings from the IRS that said that hedge fund managers, because of the funny way that they operated, could treat their income as capital gains. Well, the, the maximum tax on capital gains is now is what, 15%. Uh, the maximum tax on income is nearer to 40%. So this was an absolutely wonderful deal for the hedge fund managers. Uh, Rangel said, you know, this just doesn't make any sense. These are some of the richest people in America, and they're paying some of the lowest taxes in America. This is wrong. Let's change it. In fact, the House voted twice to change the law in 2007. Now, Schumer, uh, a powerful and influential senator, not least because of his role then as the chairman of the Senate Democratic Campaign Committee, the chief fundraising arm of Senate Democrats, and he was a prolific fundraiser uh, who had found millions and millions of dollars to help his colleagues run for election and re-election. Uh, Schumer, known for years as the senator from Wall Street, uh, lets it be known that this is not a good idea and he's not going to support it. Uh, and he goes about his business behind the scenes. Uh, I'm, and I'm sure, I don't know the whole story, don't, no one does, but I'm sure reminding people how important his fundraising is for them, you know, these other members in their reelection campaigns. Uh, and one way or another, uh, the idea passed by the House to tax this hedge fund manager's income as income never comes to a vote in the Senate Finance Committee. It is never considered. Uh, Schumer is a member, he's not the chairman, but he's an influential member, but his argument prevails. So there are no fingerprints. In fact, nothing happened. 
And this, I argue in the book, is one of the most effective kinds of lobbying in Washington. You don't, it's much easier to make something not happen than to make something happen. Uh, actually, getting something that people hadn't thought of or didn't, weren't sure they wanted to do through the Congress is really hard. But stopping something from happening, relatively speaking, can be quite easy. As this you know, was an example. Just, just so people understand more, even more fully than you've already explained it. Hedge funds operated on a basis of, I think, 2% of the amount of money under, under investment, plus 20% of profits. To the to proprietors. To, to, the to the hedge fund managers, right. exactly. And what was at stake here is whether that 20% would be ordinary income right. or whether they would be permitted to call, uh, call it capital, which was uh, uh, to which there were in, in increasing amounts every year, right. and call it capital gains. And one guy, the most infamous example, is a brilliant fellow named James Simons, who about three, four years ago made $1.5 billion in one year. But that was pikerism because last year or the year before, he made $2.7 billion. And, you know, uh, we who are, who are, uh, who, who are mere, uh, you know, ordinary people, we're paying 35 and 36 percent, and he's paying 15 percent. That's quite a thing that Mr. Schumer did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, back on the table, by the way, uh, this, this item. And Schumer has been chastened by the great financial crisis. He's no longer the senator from Wall Street. In fact, he's got his old Wall Street pals quite angry at him at the moment. So it could change, but we'll have to see. You know, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, maybe you would opine on this. I, I get the impression, Bob, that notwithstanding Wall Street lobbying is extraordinarily uh, enormous in scope today, maybe precisely because of the bailouts and the disaster, and if anything, is bigger than ever. Well, uh, I, I don't know the statistics, which are knowable, uh, but there's, yes, there's a lot of money being spent on lobbying. I mean, the whole stimulus package, the bailouts, all of this has provoked more lobbying because this is what, you know, this is the nature of the beast. And it, it's important to understand that too, I think. Why do people hire a lobbyist? Well, to get a benefit from Washington or to preserve a benefit that Washington has provided in the past are the two biggest reasons to hire a lobbyist. And when Washington is suddenly creating a whole new spending stream in the stimulus package and in the bailouts, uh, then people want a piece of that. They hire somebody to help them get the piece of it. Um, and that, that it does explain what's happened. Also, the banks and the Wall Street people realize the smart ones, I think all of them by now must realize, how public opinion has turned against them. So they're looking for protection. There are two ways to get protection. The most useful probably is campaign contributions. And we see already a big uptick in, in that number, and it's not even an election year. It we'll see more of it next year. But uh, the other is to hire a good lobbyist who helps you make your case, make your arguments. And that's what they're doing. You know, you tell some great stories in the book about uh, people at Cassidy's firm being trained by a lawyer. And if I remember correctly, a, a major lesson was don't ever go to a fundraiser and, uh, you know, where you're donating money and agree at the fundraiser with the guy that he'll vote a certain way. And then there's another story uh, to the effect that somebody wanted to uh, talk to a lobbyist, one of these is not here, not now, I'll call you later. <laughs> But yes. that's another way in which they avoid the appearance of a direct of a, quid, of pro a quid pro quo. Exactly. Yeah. It's always, and you know, one of the things that's pretty routine now in Washington is the, a lobbyist requests a meeting with a member. Uh, the lobbyist goes to see the member, makes the pitch, goes back to his or her office, and the phone rings. Oh, hi. I'm the uh, fundraiser for Congressman X, who you just met with an hour ago. Just want you to know there's a fundraiser for the Congressman next Thursday. Hope you can make it. <laughs> You know, no quid pro quo, yeah, right. but the message is very clear, right. uh, and that's, you know, that's legal and yeah. standard operating procedure. Right. right, and as you say, there are no PACs for the poor. <laughs> there are no PACs for the yeah. poor. Uh, how did a system like this ever get started? Now, you've been in Washington since 63. I was there Actually, from... since 43, where I was born there, but that's... <laughs> oh, well, excuse me. Okay. I came in 63, stayed for three years, came back in 71, stayed for another 16, and I never held a brief for Washington, but I don't remember it being anything like as bad as it apparently has gotten now. How did this happen? 
Well, we can spend the rest of the day talking about that. I think that the most important thing that happened, uh, and it was happening when you came back in 71, it was starting to happen in a big way, it was the expansion of the reach of the federal government into more and more corners of American life. The creation of whole new regulatory uh, bureaucracies. You know, we, Richard Nixon is remembered for many things. He ought to be better remembered for the fact that he created the uh, EPA, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, a whole series of new regulatory bureaucracies. Uh, domestic spending entered a whole new realm in the 60s and 70s. Government programs devoted to things that there had never been government programs for in the past. All of these actions provoke a need for help and representation in Washington. And, and I want to say, Larry, that it's wrong to think I believe that the, if you're a lobbyist, you're a bad person, that you're right. doing something corrupt and awful. Right. Uh, you know, many of the most noble institutions in American life, by my standards, have Washington lobbyists. The Red Cross has a Washington lobbyist. The Sierra Club has a big team of Washington lobbyists, right. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when you have a big, powerful government such as we have, inevitably, institutions and individuals who have interests before the government or hopes that the government will reduce the X or Y uh, are going to look for people that know how the game is played, know how the system works. Those are going to be the lobbyists. So it, it, I, I don't think we can dream of outlawing lobbying or banning it or anything of that kind. It's protected explicitly in the First Amendment of the Constitution, as you know, the right of the people to petition the government for redress of grievances, a nice definition of formal lobbying. Uh, is right there, and we're not going to eliminate that. So, to me, the the worst thing that's changed in this era that you're talking about is the rise in the cost of political campaigns and the ability of both lobbyists and interest groups of all kinds to satisfy the ever-growing appetite of members of Congress for more money. Uh, and a wonderful tool for ingratiating yourself with a senator or a member of the House, I gave in your last campaign. Oh, yeah, good. Come on in and come and talk to me. I'm glad to talk to you. Uh, access, indeed, is one of the most corrupting things that goes on. The congressman, the senator's life now in Washington is a succession of meetings with special bleeders. Uh, and who gets to have one of those meetings is sadly often tied to who gave the money for right. the last campaign. Right. Now, there have been attempts to eliminate money, which, as you were pointing out at lunch, may have may be doomed by the Supreme Court shortly. Uh, and lobbying is petitioning the government. Lobbying is free speech. But the Supreme Court, uh, for reasons that I think were understandable in their day, but which I think have become superannuated, if I may use a big word, uh, has ruled that giving money is free speech. And that seems to me to be the link, and that seems to me to be extraordinarily questionable when you consider that, number one, money is money, and number two, uh, it creates a huge imbalance in power. Hey, this is, you're referring to a, a famous Supreme Court decision called Buckley v. Vallejo, early, early 70s, right? And, yes. And it, indeed, in that case, the Supreme Court said that making a donation is an expression of free speech. I personally find this quite offensive because it seems to me that the basic rights of Americans ought to be rights that any American can enjoy. And obviously, the right to give money to a politician is not a right that every American can enjoy because not every American has money to give away. Uh, and. And yet that is the law of the land. It makes all efforts to control campaign spending difficult. Uh, and if the Supreme Court overturns the recent McCain-Feingold Act, it'll make it impossible. Um, and I don't think this is what our founders had in mind. I, on the contrary, I think the history of the, of, the, of the founding generation makes it clear that the thing that they cared about the most was preventing the rise of a permanent aristocracy in this new republic. Uh, and I'm, I, I think we're in danger of having exactly that if we allow money to talk so loudly in our politics. Uh, you know, I, I occasionally point, uh, use the phrase, uh, it wasn't Dumas, I can't remember the Frenchman who first said it, 
that the law and its majesty permits both the rich and the poor to sleep under the bridges of Paris. Yeah, anybody can give money to Congress, <laughs> just as some of us don't have it to give. <laughs> um, as part of all this, uh, uh, staffers uh, in Congress and senators and uh, representatives as well started a revolving door in which they went from the Hill to three, four, to three and four times and more of their salary as lobbyists. Well, why don't you describe how that happened and what Cassidy had to do with it and the amazing sums of money these people were being paid. This is a really important part of the story yeah, in is. my book. I, and, I, and it is a big change that's happened over the last 35 years. I, I recount the story in the book of Congressman Jim O'Hara of Michigan, a liberal Democrat, uh, who ran in a uh, primary uh, in the late 70s against Don Regal to get Democratic nomination for Senate from Michigan. He lost to Regal, another member of the House. Uh, he had to give up his House seat to run in that primary. He comes back to town, popular, nice guy, smart guy, I knew him, uh, now dead. Uh, he comes back to Washington without a job and he's got five or six kids and needs work, he needs some money. And a very famous Washington lobbyist called Tommy Boggs, running one of the biggest lobbying firms, invites him to come to his firm and become a lobbyist. And O'Hara accepts the job. Uh, it was a scandal. I remember this quite vividly. I was covering the Senate for the Washington Post at this moment. Uh, and it was the buzz of Capitol Hill. Geez, O'Hara's going to work for Tommy Boggs. That doesn't look very good, does it? Uh, and I asked Leon Panetta about this, it's in the book. Panetta said, yeah, it was uncomfortable for all of us. He, he came back up on the Hill as a lobbyist and exercising the rights of all former members to visit the floor of the House. He came up and tried to lobby people uh, now that he was out of office. And I wouldn't talk to him. A lot of my friends wouldn't talk to him. And we were his pals when he was a member of the House. But we just thought it was really un, uh, unattractive, the wrong thing to do and so on. Um, well, that was 1978, 79. Now, as you know, we have 185 former members of Congress registered to lobby. We have hundreds, probably thousands, of former aides from Capitol Hill as registered lobbyists, uh, and they make a lot of money. Uh, you know, the, the, today's member of Congress's salary is about $168,000 a year, I think. Uh, well, that's a that's the you know minimum in a big lobbying firm. I mean, a lot of these guys making four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a year, a million dollars a year as lobbyists. Uh, it's very appealing work. And interestingly, uh, this is an important point to me, a lot of the work these people do is completely a con job. There's a wonderful anecdote in this book, which I bumped into just by chance. There was a senator from Florida, a great friend of John F. Kennedy's called George Smathers, who he and Kennedy used to go out with girls, I think. Oh, they chased women together. together. And Smathers uh, was one of the first members of Congress to become a lobbyist. Uh, and the Senate historian, a nice guy, smart guy, uh, started a program of oral history where he went around talking to former senators about their careers. And I bumped into the oral history that George Smathers had given. And he describes what it was like to be an early former member uh, in the lobbying business. This would have been in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and Spathers uh, recounts, you know, some fat cat would come to town and say, can you help me with X or Y? And I'd say, sure, let's go up and have lunch and talk about it. And I'd take him to lunch in the Senate dining room, which as a former member he was entitled to do. And we'd just sit there and one after another, my old pals would come up and say, hey, George, how are you? And I'd introduce them to these two fat cats who were at my table. And we just had a good time chatting about this and that, and we'd leave. And I'd go back to my office, and I'd send them a big bill. And they'd pay it. You know what they'd say. They'd say, oh, that Smathers, he knows everybody. He's going to be terrific. <laughs> well, it was a con job. Uh, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of kind of oh, I'm near to the stars now, I mean, I'm in with the insiders. Uh, a lot of it is really quite phony. Uh, a lot of lobbying campaigns, big expensive lobbying campaigns are put on uh, and, and appear to succeed 
I, t I tell the story of two of them in this book that Cassidy was involved in. One involving uh, Taiwan, getting the president of Taiwan a visa to visit the United States, a big deal. The other was involving the Sea Wolf submarine, which, which uh, the first Bush administration tried to cancel at the end of the Cold War. We don't need this big submarine anymore. Uh, in both cases, Cassidy was involved in huge and elaborate uh, lobbying campaigns, and in both cases, the result sought was achieved. But my reporting persuaded me that in both cases, the result sought would have been achieved if Cassidy had been on vacation the whole time, that the lobbying campaign actually had no determining effect on the outcome for reasons I won't try to go into this afternoon, but it, it's all in the book. But in this case, the Sea Wolf submarine built in Connecticut, Chris Dodd and Joe Lieberman, the senators from Connecticut, uh, were the key lobbyists, and they did a brilliant job, and they got the votes to save the Sea Wolf submarine. Uh, in the case of Taiwan, the idea of supporting the first democratically elected president of Taiwan, a good guy who had thrown off a corrupt old Chiang Kai-shek regime and was responsible for modernizing Taiwan, but under the terms of our diplomatic recognition with mainland China, was not allowed to have a visa to the U.S., a lot of members of Congress, like me, probably like you, thought, gee, that's not fair. Why shouldn't the guy be able to come to the U.S. on a visit? So they voted for it. And I don't think they are either. The lobbying campaign had any big effect. But Cassidy collected literally millions of dollars in those two cases to conduct these elaborate campaigns. If I remember correctly, Lieberman and Dodds were a little angry about the fact that Cassidy was either getting or claiming credit and, and claim not even to know what he had been doing. Well, they, weren't, they didn't express any anger to me, but you're, that's a fair interpretation from what you read in the book. What, what they say was, I, I went to each of them and said, you know, here, here's what they say. And, and Chris Dodd said it the most diplomatic way. He said, really? He said, they don't, I, I just don't remember that. He said, I don't remember Cassidy being involved at all. So, now, one thing one has to say for Cassidy that really impressed me when I read the book. I mean, in a sense, I regard Cassidy, as I, as I said to you in an email, as symptomatic uh, of, what's ha of something that's happened in this country. Go good people have gone bad in chase, uh, in chase of the dollar. Uh, but one thing which impressed me is the preparation they made. I mean, why don't you describe how they went about finding out what might be possible, who might need it, how they did it. I mean, this was a real, highly organized, highly competent campaign yeah, they course. ran. I, I'm glad to do that. Let me start, though, by, by challenging you a little on your yeah. formula about good people going bad. I, it's one of the lessons I think I've learned in a long life and a lot of reporting is that it's pretty hard to, for anybody to claim, for us to claim that anybody is either good or bad. It seems to me we're all combinations of the two. And Cassidy's an interesting example. Cassidy uh, certainly has done lots of things that I wouldn't have wanted to do, uh, and you can criticize him on many fronts. Uh, he's a deeply religious Catholic. He goes to Mass every day. He's given the Catholic Church and other charities lots and lots of money. Uh, he's, he's a tough operator and not a very nice person in a, in a business dispute, uh, but I don't think he's evil. Uh, and I, I think you can't, you can't appreciate these people unless you see them whole and all their complexity. Sure, fair. Now, uh, but, but... Can I interject something? Sure. He started off poor as a church mouse. Yes. I mean, he was a kid with a life marked by violence, poverty. I mean, Alcoholism, just awful. Yeah, awful. Yeah. Uh, grew up in Brooklyn, uh, discovered only at the age of 22 that he actually wasn't Cassidy at all. His name was McIntyre. But his, his Cassidy McIntyre had abandoned his family soon after he was born, and his poor mother had hidden the truth from him for 20 years. And he did marvelous time. things it, it, within his capability for uh, uh, migrant labor. In Florida, that in was Florida, his first Including job. this fellow, you tell a story about how he got, got a kid named Charles Lucky into college. I mean, yeah. it's a very uh, it is. A striking story. It is. So, what did they do? They, once they figured out this earmark thing with Tufts and BC and BU and so on, uh, they said they realized this is a really winning formula, uh, and we can we can find business uh, all over the country for this kind of thing. And then they did something really shrewd. A, a guy called Jim Fabiani, who worked for them, uh, hired two former. Uh, big name college presidents. One was called Elvis Starr. He'd been the president of 
West Virginia University and Indiana University. The other was called Rose. He'd been the president of Alabama University. Quite a famous guy. Yeah, uh, both of them, and uh, uh, with a lot of friends among the com community of college presidents, university presidents. Uh, and they became marketers for Cassidy, Schlossberg, Cassidy and Associates, and then Cassidy and Associates. Uh, and they were 10 percenters. If they, <laughs> if they got s some university to hire the firm to look for earmarks, uh, whatever the fee was that Cassidy got from that new client, uh, Rose or Star got 10%. Can I ask you a question? I'm interrupting. I apologize. It's all right. But uh, Rose and Star would uh, introduce Cassidy to other university presidents because they were so well known in right. that community. Right. Do you think, I don't remember anything in the book about this, do you think the other university presidents knew that Rose and Star were getting a commission? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, probably not, uh, but maybe. It's, it's hard to say. Can't, I don't know. That, I can't say that. Um, but what do they do? They go, they go to the president of this university and say, here's a list of the earmarks that we've gotten for other universities. And it was, you know, it was soon quite a good and impressive long list. Uh, and we can do this for you. You must have something going on in this campus that, that the government would like to support. We'll help you figure out what it is. Uh, then we'll help you make a case for it that you can take to your senators and your congressmen. Uh, and we'll try to win their support for this enterprise. Uh, and together, we'll, you know, you'll, you'll end up with all this money. And they have their young staffers were very good at, there's a wonderful long description by a guy who, who did this for the firm for many years uh, of how you go to the university and go around the campus, meet all the, he said, well, I want to meet all the leading researchers on your campus. What are you working on? What are your projects? What could you do with some more money? Uh, sound everybody out, figure out two or three things that look like they might be in step with national ambitions, programs in Washington, whatever, Pentagon needs, Department of Health and Human Services needs, whatever they are, uh, and then organize a piece of paper, a presentation, Here, this is what we want to do. Uh, they did a lot of homework. They figure out where this fit into existing things that were going on in the country and in the world. Uh, research was always a big part of the Cassidy operation. Uh, and, and they'd cultivate then, you know, who, who are the graduates of your university who serve in Congress or, or are aides to people that serve in Congress? They build lists of friends. Who are the trustees of your university who might have good connections in Washington? Things of that kind. Uh, they really organized it, and, and it worked. It worked. And then the, the key, of course, was the, the members of Congress themselves. If it's the University of Kansas, then you want Bob Dole and the other senator from Kansas and the local member of the House, and you line them up as enthusiasts for your program. Uh, champions, they'd call them, who are our champions on this project? Uh, and and. You know, in the end, lobbyists for Cassidy d didn't do much of the legwork. The member of Congress and the staff of the member of Congress would adopt this as their own cause, and they would do the legwork. Yep. But as I understand it, and here's another thing I was going to, I said before, I was going to tell you a little story. In, 1990, in 1966, I went uh, from Washington, where I had worked for eight months on Proxmire staff, and Smathers was just down the hall, you see. Uh, and I, I had an article that I wanted to print it in the Kansas Law Review. And in the article, I said, well, this bill was actually written by so-and-so, not by uh, the senator who claimed uh, to have written it. And the, the uh, fellows on the Law Review at Kansas, who were bright guys, you know, and imbued with the civics culture, said, can you get a cite for the fact that lobbyists write? <laughs> Nobody talks about this. It's, well, now people are talking about it. Uh, but I get the sense, uh, and I'm curious as to what you find as you go around the country, that the country at large doesn't understand that either the executive branch and or private lobbyists write the bills, write the reports that are cited as legislative history, write the speeches that people make on the floor that are cited by legislative history, the whole thing has been, what is it when you uh, say to somebody else outside, outsourced. Outsourced. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a major part of Washington now, isn't it? It is. And I'm, I, I'm, one of my theses in the book is that there's been a general decline in the quality of Congress. 
which I believe is true. And one manifestation of this is how little original work gets done in Congress. The most important original work, in my opinion, is oversight. It's actually exposing things that are going on that shouldn't be going on, watching how government agencies are doing what they're supposed to be doing, et cetera. It's a lost art almost. There's very little oversight compared to the old days, and it, it's a big loss. Uh, but you know, it is true that very few of the bills passed by the Congress are written by members of Congress. Few, maybe none, in, in truth. They're written sometimes by outsiders, often by the executive branch, and most often of all by the staff. The, the role of the staff, the importance of the staff, is not well appreciated. It's really big. Uh, why don't you elaborate that a little more? What, what do staffers do? Because they're the eyes, the ears, the pens. They're, they're almost the congressman himself or herself. The life of a member of the House or Senate today is so scattered, so disorganized, so uh, you're jumping from one subject to another. You belong to too many committees. You've got, you got, if you're a senator, you belong to three committees. Uh, members of the House can belong to two to four committees. Uh, it's very hard to master any of the subjects. You're a, you're a, you know, a fly. You're flitting around. You're doing a little of this, a little of that, a little of the other. Uh, you're traveling home every weekend because that's supposed to be inevitably the way to get reelected. Now you can't live in Washington. Very few of them do. Uh, you're constantly meeting supplicants who are coming to ask for favors of one kind and another. Uh, so actually doing the hard slogging is increasingly rare for the members themselves. You know, and, and it's left to the staff to do all that. So there's a lot of substantive work. And even when there's some important thing going on, like the health care debate in Washington right now, health care reform debate, uh, you've got Chris Dodd sitting in for the ailing Senator Kennedy as the, as the acting chair of the Senate Committee on Health, Labor, and so on. And you've got Max Baucus, the chairman of the Finance Committee. They both have jurisdiction here. Uh, they're both negotiating these extremely complicated matters. They talk to each other, I'm sure, but I know, because I've seen this happen again and again and again, when they get to a hard part where they can't work out the details of something, they'll both turn to their staff and say, you guys get together and work this out. And they do. The real negotiation, the real compromise, the real you know, the drafting, the important critical part of the function, writing the bill, is done by the staff. Am I roughly correct, Bob? <clears throat> Back in the day when I was uh, in Washington, uh, congressional staffers, staffers numbered maybe three or four thousand. Now they number about ten thousand or something like that. Don't yeah, they? Yes, it grew a lot beginning in the late 70s. Uh, it, it stopped growing, and, and indeed Newt Gingrich cut it back some in the 90s. Uh, but it's, yes, it, it's a huge army. Although arguably, you could, you could smart members say, I wish I had more people because I'm all in all these other committees. I can't keep up with all the issues. I could use two or three more people to help me do it. You know, I'm going to get back to that in a second, but there's something I neglected to ask you and I, I don't want to forget. You know, you were explaining a, a long time ago here, uh, as, a, as a television show goes a long time ago, <laughs> uh, the difference between appropriations committees and what they do and authorization committees and what they do and how the former is usurped the latter and so on. And, and another thing that's very critical, and, and Cassidy and the other lobbyists make use of it uh, extensively, is that conference committees can put things into bills that was never in the version passed by the House and never in the version passed by the Senate. Why don't you explain how this works? And this is staggering, to me at least. Well, again, it, it, this is this whole world of conference committees and conference reports is supra-constitutional, right? It's something that the founders envisaged, and there are no governing laws for these procedures. What happens basically is the Congress passes a housing bill, the House passes a housing bill, the Senate passes a housing bill. They have a lot in common, but they have many different provisions. They both send members of the committees that drafted these bills to a conference committee. They meet and try to hash out the differences and create, in effect, a third piece of legislation, which is a melding of the first two. And then that piece is sent back to both bodies, which vote on it. If they all support it, then it's sent to the president to become law. Uh, 
in that conference committee, there are no rules uh, requiring that uh, the, the final bill produced include only provisions that were in one or the other of the original bills. And this is the opening that you've referred to, you, so that the conferees, as they're called, have the opportunity to cook up something entirely new and different uh, to put into the bill. Uh, and, they, and they've done it quite freely. Now, interestingly, in the, in the conferences were very, were SOP, standard operating procedure, until the mid-90s. But once the Republicans won back control and the partisan warfare escalated to the high level that is now typical, uh, in fact, there are fewer conferences. Uh, and in both houses, they try to avoid conferences. It's an arcane subject, but uh, so there's probably somewhat less of this than there used to be, if it's any comfort. But the power is there. And How do they reconcile bills? Uh, with pre-conferences. This is a recent example. Both, uh, both houses wanted to, in the, in the wake of the financial crisis, toughen up the rules on the banks that issue credit cards. The House passed a bill pretty strong bill. The Senate passed a stronger bill. Chris Dodd, in trouble in Connecticut, wanting to show off how tough he was with the banks, toughened it up. Um, the House, Barney Frank's committee particularly, which did the House bill, saw what was happening. Uh, Frank and, and Dodd, more accurately Frank's staff and Dodd's staff, uh, get together and say, we see what's going on here. We can probably support, we in the House, what you and the Senate are doing, provided you make sure your bill includes these three things in our bill that are really important to us. That's called a pre-conference. Okay. So it's not, you know, it's not after the passage, it's literally before the passage. Okay. So the Senate version of the credit card bill it does indeed incorporate these three things that the House says are really important to us. Uh, at which point, Barney Frank announces, we will embrace the Senate bill. So Dodd's bill passes the Senate, it comes back over to the House, and it's brought up without any change or amendment and passed by the House, goes to Obama, he signs the bill. Uh, so that, that is now much more common than it used to be. And, and it's because it's so hard, given the rise of partisanship, a subject we probably ought to talk a little more about, uh, uh, to, to have constructive yeah. Yeah. Agreement. I mean, one of the one of the functions of this new culture in Washington is that for partisans on both sides, the end justifies the means. Uh, the idea of a collegial effort to find a middle ground and so on has really pretty much disappeared. Right. Sadly, right. let me hold that for just a minute and ask you one last question first. Uh, when we finish the first hour of this discussion. Uh, one last question about the earmarks. Uh, when, when people began to understand what Cassidy was doing, everybody jumped on the bandwagon because everybody wanted a piece of the action. Uh, and there came a time, as the trial lawyers say, when John Danforth, who happens to be, I guess, good buddies with a guy I went, I roomed with my first year in Michigan, it's also a fraternity brother, uh, John Danforth threatened the whole thing. Right. Would you explain what happened there as our last item of business in this it's, hour? It's a wonderful story. Danforth, an Episcopal minister, a very wealthy heir to the Ralston Purina fortune, uh, an old-fashioned liberal Republican, a kind of salt and stall Republican, if you will, uh, as a brother, uh, William Danforth, a distinguished medical scientist, who is the president or chancellor of Washington University in St. Louis and a big deal in the uh, AAU, the Association of American Universities. The AAU is the 50 top universities in America. And it is it's offended. the research university. Yes, it is offended by the earmarks as they burgeon and grow yeah. because they believe in what they call peer review, that the government shouldn't give away money to Tufts University just because Tip O'Neill thinks it's a good idea, that if the government thinks that they should sponsor, for example, a nutrition research center, they should have a contest and let anybody who thought they had a good idea for how to do that submit a plan for a nutrition research center. And then the peers, the academic experts chosen 
from the, the creme of the, the, creme of the uh, academic world would decide who deserved to get the money. Uh, this, of course, is self-serving in its own way because the senior research universities are likely often to have the most persuasive argument for their idea. They have the best people, they have the best facilities, that's why they're the best universities. Uh, but, but on the other hand, at least there's some fair-minded outside judgment about which program is most deserving. So, uh, Brother Danforth, Chancellor Danforth persuades Senator Danforth that, that these earmarks are really getting out of hand and they ought to be stopped. John Danforth, the senator, gets up on the floor is in the 80s and says uh, and proposes on a defense appropriations bill to eliminate eight or nine, I've forgotten the number, of academic earmarks to universities that are in that bill. Uh, and says, you know, we, we're, this is out of hand now. We've got to stop this. We've got to keep focused on merit, on which are the most deserving and the, and the highest potential plans and not, and not give away research money because of somebody's political connections. Uh, and it passes. Uh, it passes pretty easily in the Senate. Uh, and this causes a red alert in the lobbying community, the earmark community, and among many members of the appropriations committees who have come to see earmarks as a way to feather their own political nests. Uh, Cassidy and his associates are in the vanguard of a hastily gathered war against the Danforth Amendment, as it's called. Uh, they prepare all kinds of research material. They show how uh, the peer review system that does exist for the NIH grants and other things for research favors the, the, the big guys, the, you know, the rich get richer kind of thing. Um, they cultivate all the, go to all members of the appropriations committee saying, you don't really want this to happen because this will diminish your own personal clout and power. And three weeks later, they get the thing back for a second vote and they reverse it. They get almost as big a margin against the Danforth Amendment the second time as they had the first time in favor of it. And that's really the last effort 20 plus years ago to, to stop this system. And it failed and that yeah. was the end. The and there was some truth to the matter that it was an ingrown system in which the top 50 or 58 universities, yes. uh, which some of which were small, Brandeis was a member of it, uh, they were uh, controlling all the money going in, into research. They didn't control it, but they got uh, the lion's share of it. Got the, the lion's share of it. because It was a club. That's the fundamental point was right. it was a club. Uh, we are going to wrap up this hour. When we come back the next hour, we will start uh, with your, uh, the points you want to make about the partisanship right. that is now infested, taken over, use whatever verb one wants, uh, Washington to the nth degree. Right. So to the audience, be with us again the next time when we will continue with Robert Kaiser, a reporter for and the former managing editor of the Washington Post. Thank you. Be with us again. And thank you. Thank you.